Hello everyone, it's Laurel Lindstrom speaking again with part 14 of the Sitting Comfortably podcasts. This is me reading from my first novel, The Draftsman, which is due out next January with Unbound. If you would like to support the book, I'd be thrilled to bits. Um, You get your name printed in it as a supporter and you get to read the print copy. Otherwise, you can just listen to me reading from it. Uh, We are now up to part two of chapter five. So I will begin and thank you very much for listening. Are we sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. Chapter five, part two. The chapter is called Accidental Fortunes. He told his dad he was going on a business trip to Cambridge with his boss. It's about drawing. That's all. I always knew you'd make it to Cambridge one day, his dad replied, but Martin didn't get the joke. Instead, he stared at the television between counting the baked beans and chips on the plate his mother had put in front of him and working out their ratios. You'll need to be clean and ready early, she said, wistful hope, mingling in the stifling scream of the cramped steam of the cramped kitchen. I know, Mum. I'll be ready early. I'll catch the first bus. No need to get up for me. I can manage. And he stared even harder at Animal Hospital and creepy Rolf Harris. She stared too. He's wonderful, isn't he? And such a clever painter. Martin filled his mouth with eight chips and 22 baked beans and seven millimetres of sausage, then pressed the remote to change the channel. The next morning, waiting at the bus stop for the first or maybe second 93 bus of the day, Martin felt strangely ready for what he did not know would happen. A sensation of anticipation, but with no noise in his head. Instead, he knew that the bus would come, so he started counting the seconds. He knew he would sit upstairs, but that he wasn't allowed to smoke any more, and could calculate the number of puffs he would have to forego for the journey. He knew he would reach Putney Bridge Station and be able to dance his unique routine across the lines and corners in the pavement, and that he would have a model in his head that matched their numbers. He knew the office would be closed, and that Bill had said he would be waiting outside for Martin, and that they would drive together to Cambridge. But he didn't know anything more. He saw only a blank empty space where something should be, This new, rising road, not so distant, and with shadows still a void of silence, and a new intangible gained. On the bus, and sitting very still in this unfamiliar moment, he was skewered into an unknown shape that he could not recognise. The sensation dwindled away as he counted the lines on the upholstery, on the back of the seat in front of him, and was reassured that there were as many today as there had been yesterday. The early, slow shunting movement through the traffic gradually sent Martin into a doze, and he was deep asleep by the time the bus reached the end stop. He woke up, confused, before he remembered today was different. His path would be the same, but only so far. Walking along the pavement to the office, head down and automatic, Martin saw the unwritten space growing wider and wider, the noise in his head getting louder and louder, biting his lip between the drags on his cigarette as he prepared to step off his map, a surprisingly willing victim of a new unknown. Bill was shining bright with early morning excitement and waving to him as Martin rounded the corner. Ah, there you are, Martin, all set. We can head off straight away. A blank, yes, and a cigarette end dropped into an open drain's wide and greedy gills, hissing malevolent its dying breaths when it touched the fetid water at the bottom. As the car door slammed, Martin was transfixed by the dashboard, its alien colours, circles, needles and lights, an orderly chaos of functions and calculation options. The only car he'd ever been in was his dad's black cab even for his driving test. 
so the array of dials and switches in this sleek new car held his attention for most of the journey. He calc counted, calculated dimensions, dis distances, ratios and fractions in silence all the way to Cambridge. And Bill, glancing occasionally over at his passenger as they burned up the M11, was glad of the peace and appearance of calm. He was also very glad that his clients had agreed to meet them so that they could explain for Martin what they wanted done and the Bigwell Edwards and Staines part of the project could be concluded and invoiced. It was also a good chance to show Martin another side of the business, although Bill wasn't too sure what the point of that would really be. A couple of hours later, and they were pulling into a white-lined patch of pavement marked Blast Technologies, Visitor Parking. We're here, Martin. Time, time to focus. Martin looked about him, unbuckled his seatbelt and stood carefully out of the car. So this is Cambridge, he thought. Not much to it. Not worth the bother of A-levels, before turning to follow his boss through a plate glass door set in grey clad walls and into a reception area with a counter and a sign with exchangeable white letters. Today it said, Blast Technologies welcomes Bill Edwards, Martin Cox, Bigwell Edwards and Staines. Why? thought Martin, and wondered where the students in the toilets were. I need the toilet, he said, as Bill signed a register. A smiling lady bobbed up from behind the counter and gestured at a wall where there were doors to the toilets. Wait, said Bill, I'll come with you. Smiling nicely back at the lady as she handed them their health and safety badges, he followed Martin to the loos. Don't forget, Martin, this is a business meeting. Don't ask for anything. Just wait until you're offered, OK? OK, but I need to go. They were only sitting at the reception for a moment before two men joined them, making introductions and nodding and thanking them for coming. And would they like a coffee or some water? The older one was grey-haired small and stocky, with carbon black eyes and a flat, expressionless face that scanned Martin up and down, top to toe, with almost audible precision. Martin watched him, cautious and quiet, as instructed. The face came suddenly and unexpectedly alive as his partner joined him to welcome the visitors. The tall, thin co-owner of Blast Technologies glanced down at his older, smaller partner, looking for a cue, then he saw his partner's teeth appear suddenly from behind generous lips, now upturned on one side, a leer masquerading as a grin. The lips quickly stretched, rubber band thin, into a charming and beguiling, almost seductive smile. The eyes stayed black and expressionless. How was your journey? Not too bad, I hope. Welcome, welcome. His tall, thin companion's arms were folded across his chest reaching round behind him, and he kept his stained and ugly teeth safe and hidden. By way of a greeting, he merely raised the corners of his mouth and leant forward, unravelling his arms to stretch out to the visitors and echoed, Welcome! Shifting slightly forward in a half bow as he did so, Bill, beaming back at the pair, earnestly grasped the outstretched hand. So pleased you could take the time to see us, he said, and gesturing to Martin, this is the chap who's doing your drafting and he just wants to go through with you how it is supposed to work. With the signal to the receptionist to do the necessaries with teas and coffees, the man with the pictureless eyes and the two wide smile said, let's go through. Short, rapid steps and animated, he was talking over his shoulder, enthusing about the new design, the hopes for it and how important it was to get it right, so of course they could take the time to explain. But it's not right. Martin blurted, confused and overwhelmed and not expecting his voice to sound quite so loud. The words bounced out of his mouth, hitting the walls before tussling with the small group as it moved in an uncomfortable and irregular mess along the pastel corridor. The walls were peppered with images of smiling employees doing worthy deeds between large windows beyond which was a large open plan office. Martin said it again, this time much less loudly, and they all smiled kindly and slightly awkwardly back at him and said, yes, yes, of course. 
They had to wait until the time was right, until the prescribed rituals had all been followed. As they moved bris briskly forwards towards a large conference room, Martin took note of the office cubicles. Twenty-four, and the large airy space beyond the windows, looking out onto similar buildings, one less than prime, subprime. He understood that this Cambridge was an imposter. In the conference room, Bill folded his long frame neatly into his chair and sat with his elbows on the table and his hands clasped under his chin. Martin, pacing by the window, wanting a smoke before heeding his boss to take a seat. Bill explained what, that Martin was doing the work for Blast, but that he had some questions. This cue went unheard, and the room was filling with a soundless energy, rising as three sets of eyes watched the floppy hair get dragged back and the pale young man fix his own eyes on the ceiling. Still counting the little holes and corners in the ceiling tiles, he squeezed out an almost mumble in his effort not to shout, and he said again, I'm, I'm not sure what you want, that's all. Relief at the broken silence, and so they started. Let's give you a bit of background, shall we? Blast Technologies has an interesting history, and most of the people working here have local connections. We've been working on our technology for a number of years, and this latest advance is our biggest gamble yet. We know what we are doing, but this new head changes everything, and it could be very big for us. I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Clive, Clive Marshall, and this is Richard Jaynes. Clive's eyes and smile, now both alive and energetic, Richard's mouth still tight shut, running his finger down his bony nose, bridge to tip, bridge to tip, as he watched his partner in action through beady little pinched-in eyes. Together, they nodded across the desk, waiting, and this time, bolder and louder, but not in a shout, Martin heard himself, I can't draw your image, I need to understand what it's for, because it's all wrong. The three men stared momentarily at him, hearing that last word spinning in the air, its multiple of edgy blades slicing at the vanity of those who think they are in control. The spin continued in the silence until it was suddenly broken, when Bill added that, that Martin's seen something in your sketch that perplexes him. Could you explain more about what it does and, and how it works? Wrong was not a concept to even consider. But Martin still stared blankly at the no longer smiling faces, waiting for what happened next. As I said, let's start with a bit of background. And standing up, short but punchy, Clive clicked a live screen and launched a 33-slide technical presentation of what an inkjet printhead is, how it works, and what it can be used for. Martin interrupted only to confirm his understanding, and at the end, he saw that the technology could be used to print onto any surface, from glass to ceramics to clothes and textiles, food and objects even. He understood that the technology already exists, and that it, the use of it in the office was common, but that this was something more. Warming to the theme and relieved that this curious young man appeared to get it, Richard stopped stroking his nose. He peered through fingerprinted specks at an empty point on the wall and briskly said, eventually it will do all this as well as working in a desktop printer. But we're a long way yet from that point. We see this as a starting point for the next generation and a way of changing production of all sorts of things. All sorts. Martin had watched the slides, different ideas appearing and disappearing, asking questions stored up in his head until the last slide, the one that said questions. Looking at the prototype they had placed on the desk, he was still wondering why they had designed their print head as it was and not as it should be. It's still not making sense to me why this is incomplete, based on what you've told us, Martin continued. Fluid flow and droplet size and control could be much more precise with one small change and I think you'd need to jet less ink so prints could be cheaper for users, yes? At this last observation, 
Clive and Richard paused, open-mouthed, and the blood drained from their faces. They stared across the table at the impertinent young man who had seen something hidden, some gem of engineering logic that had passed them by. Martin had stopped short of calling it wrong again, but there was no mistaking the challenge, the defiance. They weren't quite angry, but they glanced one to the other, shocked and disbelieving and uncertain how to respond. They pointed out that they had been designing print heads for the last nine years, and with all due respect to you and, of course, to Bill, I think we know what we're doing. But Martin, with rising confidence, pulled back his hair and said, I don't know how, but you've missed something. Neither partner knew what to say or how to respond. They sat, leaning across the table, the carbon eyes, the smudged glasses, fixed, both of them, on Martin. As the sandwiches and fruit were wheeled in for lunch, the brittle crystal instant shattered as the atmosphere breathed a little easier with the new air and scents coming into the room. Uh, perhaps this is a good place to pause and we can learn more about how you came up with this idea, said Bill. While Martin just stared at the prototype, turning it over in his hands, weighing it and peering through a loop at the print samples scattered about on the table, counting tonal transitions, and fascinated that there were no visible lines or patterns. They ate carefully, with Clive and Richard alternately glancing sidelong, sidelong at each other and at their curious visitor. Bill continued to chat, a comfortable stream of trivia swirling around them, washing away the broken shards. Fed and watered, Martin stayed quiet, not sure what was supposed to happen next. This place was not Cambridge, but a business just like where he worked, just another business where other people worked, just ordinary, just another cog in the machine. His head was full of ideas, not about what was wrong with the blast prototype, which would do with what they wanted, but why? With, with the design, why was it incomplete, imperfect? Why? he said suddenly. Why have you made the chamber this way? Clive and Richard looked hard at Martin and Clive said, because it's the logical thing to do to improve on what we've done before. Do you have a better idea? The sarcasm shrouded in an insincere smile as Richard proffered more sandwiches. Martin, chewing away on a cheese and pickle, right-angled and crustless triangle, stared at him and said through the mush, Yes, I do. I can see a way to make this print head much better for what you want it to do. It has to jet fast with minimal energy and it mustn't be prone to clogging. That's what you want, isn't it? What I would suggest is to improve its performance when it's active, especially for what you said you want it to do. It could be much better and... Bill stopped him. Martin, are you sure you really can see a better way? <laughs> if you can, we'd be interested to know, Richard interjected, sarcastic and faithless. Bill looked carefully from face to face at the sandwiches, the prototype the print samples, and remembered a lesson from his father. Don't share your secrets without a deal in place first, he had said. At the time, the conversation was about Christmas presents and if he should tell his brother what he'd got their mum for Christmas, what price the secret if he shared it? What risk of the secret being spilled? But Martin was way ahead. This was a business this was where all those young men and women in their 24 cubicles and their view across the open Cambridge skies were there because of money, not study. He got it that Clive and Richard's brilliance didn't extend to a dual cavity input and output system that would provide constant pressure to keep fluids flowing consistently and minimising the risk of clogging. They'd never thought of it before, and now there was no room for such a radical departure from what they knew was right or what they thought they knew was right. Clogging had had a slide all to itself in the presentation, so it must be very important. Martin had his own brilliance to share, and if it was business, it would have to come at, its pr at a price. 
just as his work for Bill had a price and Bill's for him. As the quiet descended, a nameless energy rose in the room, creeping up around them, wisping its way across the spaces in between, across the gaps into their imaginations. Martin said, If I tell you how this can be improved, what will you pay me? Is this a joke? Clive laughed and leant back in his chair, hands on head and arms raised, bent at the elbows. Convict style and man-spreading in supreme confidence. He looked across at his colleague, Richard, his brain in overdrive and his mouth working desperately around formless silent sounds, frowned and leaning in a contrasting scoliotic hunch, peered at Martin and said, What do you want if your idea really does make a difference to my design? Martin had been thinking £25,000, which was what his dad always said he wanted to be able to spend on them for a year, just for presents and little trips to the countryside and new clothes. But Martin said nothing, but instead counted how many times he could go from home to work on the 93 for £25,000 if he didn't get a weekly season ticket, but paid his fare every day. Bill looked on in shocked silence from Martin to Clive and to Richard. Clive answered first, licking his lips, irony oozing at the edges of his mouth and almost dribbling down his chin. This was all a silly joke. The boy couldn't possibly have much to add. We'd have to discuss the details, but we'd be prepared to offer you a percentage of revenues if the prototype works, more if your design holds up in the manufacturing process. £25,000, Martin ventured, as Bill cut in, would be added to that for me as broker. Martin, fully off his map and ambling blind across a blank landscape, was trying to calculate what numbers they were really talking about, but had no starting point. So he just closed his mouth and eyes and nodded. We'll need a contract like an employment contract that says what we've agreed to do together. Bill smiled at the phrase, which was his from three years ago, when he had asked Martin to sign his employment contract. He added, I can put that in hand and send you over a draft. It will be an agreement in principle, prior to anything formal, but it will be binding. Rising as he said this, Richard and Clive rose also, smiling at each other. And we'll expect the draft for our patent application when, Clive said, with just the merest hint of smug. When I can show you what it should look like, Martin said. It won't take long, once we've an agreement. You'll probably want to rewrite your application in any case. They stopped smiling and looked back in a state of profound confusion, a mixture of fascination, shock and annoyance. Maybe it all wasn't a silly joke. Thanks for lunch and your time, Bill said. I think it's fair to say that this has been quite an extraordinary meeting. Small smiles and nods, and now Clive and Richard were running their fingers through their hair and scratching at anonymous itches, hands on backs of head, sidelong glances at Martin, and neither of them really sure if they should take him seriously or not if this was all silly or not. Blast Technologies is based on innovation and unconventional approaches to problem solving, Richard said, not realising that he was quoting from a press release. <coughs> Excuse me. His brain, incapable of coming up with an original closing line. Yes, said Martin. And now you can have new problems to solve. Another cliché of indeterminate origins. Bill was holding the plate glass door and shook his head as he thanked their hosts. Out in the fresh air, he let out a long sigh and said, Well, that was quite a performance. I hope you know what you're on about. Martin looked back at him. Now I understand why it didn't make sense. It was just wrong. And it was only clear once I understood what they wanted it to do. I can see a better way now that I understand, and they can't see it because they've been doing it their way for too long. He smiled and lit a cigarette, taking a long, deep lungful and watching the smoke 
slowly spire away as he exhaled, relieved and calm. Driving back to Martin's 93 bus stop, Bill said he would earn the 25 grand by tomorrow. And so it had been. The next time they were at Blast Technologies, it was with a signed and witnessed copy of an agreement in principle and subject to manufacturing viability to pay Martin Cox 5% of annual revenues from the Blast PZX26 printhead and its derivatives. He was barely 20 years old. They also had a folder with Martin's modifications to the PZX26, which they had renamed the P. Said X twenty six C for Cox. <coughs> Excuse me again. The final contract, drawn up by Joshua's firm at Bill's request, included an additional clause that grandfathered the deal in the event that Blast Technologies was taken over by another company. When the agreement was finally signed and sealed, Bill had written to Martin to congratulate him and thank him for getting him the twenty five thousand pound brokering fee. When the first commission cheque had arrived, Martin had promptly signed it over to Bill. By the time the second and third cheques had come in and been signed over, Bill had insisted that Joshua take care of Martin's financial and tax planning. Martin continued to go to work and quickly moved on from the Blast PZX26C, although he had a picture of it on his wall and occasionally looked at it for flaws, which he never found. Every quarter, Martin met with Joshua, who explained what monies had come in and how they'd been invested. There was always the same conversation about what Martin could draw down and about what it was okay to spend the money on, how it was okay to spend the money at all. Martin's answer was always the same, as they too sat on opposite sides of Joshua's broad and immaculately tidy desk. It's fine. I have my pay. And my parents don't want much. I don't need anything extra. And then Martin's parents died. That's the end of the latest Sitting Comfortably podcast. It's the end of Chapter 5 of The Draftsman. I hope you've enjoyed listening to it. And I look forward to bringing you the beginning of Chapter 6. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Oh, and have a lovely day. Have a lovely day.